We covered that earlier. You cannot be loaned the bank's assets. It's a violation of federal law. <clears throat> Yet in reality, the loan is funded by the note. Again, that's the authoritative source that creates the debt. We know that the notes are not a debt. We know that the mortgage is not a debt. It's clearly established in the law and in the court cases. However, the note is the authorization for them to make that loan based upon the reserves that the banks keep at the Federal Reserve Bank, which happen to be those reserves, as identified once again in their own purpose and functions by the Board of Governors. <clears throat> so, the bank has rights in depositing the promissory notes as the serv servicer, fiduciary, trustee, or safekeeper. Makes total sense when you think about it this way, because you sign the note and you hand it to Mr. Banker. He's now the holder. Matter of fact, it even mentions that in here, that the bank is identified as a note holder. Well, I'm glad that you're holding it. That's real nice. However, if I'm holding this book, this is the nature and power of contract laws that people don't understand. I'm holding this book. Does that mean it's mine, and does it mean that I have rights to it? No, it does not, because this happens to be a friend of mine's book, and I have an obligation to give it back to him. I do not have the right to go and sell this to somebody else because it's someone else's book. So just because a bank or any corporation says, I'm the holder, I have rights, what rights do you have? And who gave you such rights to do that is the question that needs to be asked. And it also needs to be very, very specifically defined because if it's not defined, then there wasn't a proper meeting of the minds about the essential elements of a contract, therefore there is no contract. <clears throat> in order to get a private deposit transaction in the public eye, one has to get the agreement from the bank and then simply have the altered, inaccurate, non-disclosed, incorrect information corrected and make sure all executed or known documents in the file mandated by the bank. The bank offered documents that can be made public. The bank is also regulated by U.S. government, uh, the OCC, which is the Office of Comptroller of Currency, uh, the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, and the Federal Reserve uh, Bank Board of Governors. Then one can be assured that the governmental agency's regulation regulating the bank can aid in correcting, fixing uh, the issues as well, if done correctly. If neither helps, in other words, what I'm talking about is if neither the bank nor the banker's regulators help, uh, it's a reasonable question both parties of negligence and safe and sound banking practices, not fully disclosing the entire agreement, unlawful enrichments of proceeds by selling someone else's property without full consent and knowledge, and absolutely ge the genuine authentic evidence. ABC Bank is a servicer and not the lender. Uh, there's a lot more issues that can go in there as well, but those are just some of the things that come to my mind if they're going to try to hide something or uh, if they try to tell you one thing, but they won't give you full disclosure. Uh, as we said earlier, look, if you really loan me your own capital, why won't you say it in court in front of the judge? Why won't you say it publicly under the penalty of perjury? You always go back and say, we extended credit. Well, extending credit is still a loan of something of value, so it's still a loan. So is that a yes or a no? Well, the note's not important. Okay, if the note's not important, why don't you give it back to me, and I'll just give you a certified copy of it. You take a copy of it and see if you can still organize your reserves at the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve demands only, only, only original documents. And the entire game would be exposed at that point in time. So... I'd like to see one of those two done, but as of right now, we've got nothing but you're crazy, you're an internet scammer, um, again, character assassination, totally avoiding the simple fact of yes or no. It's a real simple question. If there's a yes or no to that, I'll shut up. Generally, debt is defined that which is due from one person to another. This definition is in the sense of an obligation. Again, we talked about modern money mechanics and some of the uh, other publications, but again, modern money mechanics, which has been taken off the shelves at, at the Chicago Federal Reserve. You can't get them no more, but they're still there, and it does exist. It says on page 6, of course, they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. Again, wipes out that theory, again, from one of their own publications. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do is accept promissory notes in exchange for credits to the borrower's transaction account. So what you're borrowing is credits? I don't think the American people buy that. You're, you're borrowing a credit and you're getting a building called a house for a credit? And then every week you have to pull out 
what you've been told to believe is money and pay back the bank money for their extension of credit? It doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> the same holds true inside of, again, their own book under the definitions of their different sources of money. Um, they call these the money aggregates. <clears throat> the money aggregates are measured uh, in accordance to M1, M2, and M3 money. If that theory was true of what they say, what they say, that they extended credit, and you're paying them back in cash money from what they told you was money, not what's legally money, what they're telling you is M1 money, measure of U.S. money stock that consists of currency held by public. Traveler's checks, demand deposits, and other checkable deposits. And the next thing is M2 money, uh, which is U.S. money stock consists of M1, uh, certain overnight repurchase agreements and certain overnight uh, dollars, savings, deposits, so on and so forth. M3 is measure of U.S. money stock that consists of M2 time deposits of $100,000 or more depository. Well, did you ever agree to accept credit and then pay back your cash? for it and I think it would only be fair to say that if I loaned you credit that you could actually pay me back in credit or if I loaned you uh, something of value in agreement you would have to loan me back the same thing uh, hence what the Federal Reserve System is saying is that they're loaning you credit and you're agreeing to pay them back in a different source of, uh, of a resource so you're giving them cash back for an extension of credit well they can extend credit well I'd like to just extend you credit back. They wouldn't accept that, would they? And I don't think the American people would either. <clears throat> Unwittingly, America has returned to its pre-American revolutionary feudal roots whereby all land is held by a sovereign and the common people have no rights to a lodial title or property. Once again, we the people are tenants and sharecroppers renting our own property from a sovereign in the guise of the Federal Reserve Bank. We all know what debt is when we use our own money, someone else's. On the other hand, it may not be so easy to understand that many of our financial assets are someone else's debts. Again, that comes out of the two faces of debt, uh, Federal Reserve publication. Very, very hard for me to grasp the concept of being anti-government or anti-banking when I'm acting like Thomas Jefferson. Thomerson, Thomas Jefferson said that we did not need a central bank. That if we did go to a central bank, that's when tyranny was going to overcome this entire nation. That's when the banks are going to take over. They're going to start influencing politics. They're going to start influencing everyone. And what do they do now? They definitely do influence all that. Matter of fact, inside of their nice little purpose and functions book, it says that they actually are designed for the government. I believe it was on page number five. They play a major role. <coughs> excuse me. Um, excuse me. It was page number three. That was the wrong one. These components share responsibility for supervising, regulating certain financial institutions and activities, and providing banking services to depository institutions and to the federal government. So they are designed as a banking surplus for the government. What I didn't hear in there is that they provide banking for the people. They could have wrote that in there. Why didn't they? They didn't write that in there. They, they clearly made it established that they're a bank for the government. Where's our bank then? If they're not a bank for us. Or if the bank is actually an agent for the government and we're going down there, are we actually opening up an account with a bank or are we opening up an account with the government? Interesting. Now, <clears throat> one thing that a lot of bankers will try to say is they, they go through this negotiable instrument stuff. Um, a negotiable instrument um, is defined in the, United, in the Uniform Commercial Code. However, because the bank has to put forth certain dollar amounts in stock to become a member bank of the Federal Reserve, it's buying stock in, the, in, that, uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank, we have to look inside the Securities and Exchange Commission for the definitions of what these documents really are because they are going to be registered documents. These documents actually get pooled together with a government-sponsored enterprise or entity 
and they're pooled together and, and then the interest thereof is sold over and over again in the secondary market. Well, for all practical purposes inside um, Article 8 of the Uniform Commercial Code, it clearly establishes a distinct difference between a security used for banking reasons and a security used for the securities industry in the secondary market. And the two are totally different from each other, but what Article 8 definitely uh, makes very clear is that the securities that are sold in the open market are not to be construed as securities as in the banking industry. So when somebody says security, you really have to go back and find out what type of security they're talking about, which again is going to be inside of Article 8 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, this book was written by Sandra M. Rocks. Uh, it is published and copyright protected by the American Bar Association. It's their book. I can find no other place to find good source of information from the very people who write the laws that uh, govern a certain topic. And inside here, I'll show you real quickly. Um, <clears throat> how they call the scope of Article 8. In other words, what does Article 8 cover? Where does its scope go to? It says, as noted above, Article 8 provides the commercial law rules for acquisition, if you acquire this, holding and transferring of interest in securities and other investment properties. The definition of security contained in 8-102 with help from 8-103 has little to do with the definition of security that is developed for the purposes of federal securities law. Article 8's definition is intended to cover assets that one would normally expect to be bought and sold as securities in today's marketplace, and it has four components. First, the asset must be an obligation of the issuer. Well, this is an obligation of the issuer, right? Well, it depends on who you call the issuer. Did the bank issue that or did you issue it? If the bank issued it, then it's the bank's obligation, not yours. Can't be that. You'd have to be the issuer in order for that section to even make sense. You issued the note, so it's your obligation. That's the first one. Second, the asset must take one of three forms. It must be in bearer form, registered form, or uncertificated form. Uncertificated is just book entries. They work on book entries. And third, the asset must be in one or one of a class of series or by its terms be divisible in a class of series shares, participations, interests, or obligations. Well, the bank does have a interest. It's a fiduciary interest because they're holding it, and it's also an obligation, so it would fall under both them categories. And then fourth and finally, the asset must function like a security, meaning that it's dealt or traded in the securities industry. Again, on the bottom of this note, what a lot of people forget to do, and this is an actual note, uh, at the very bottom of this it says it's Fannie Mae Freddie Mac's instrument. Okay, <clears throat> I invoked Fannie Mae into clarification, and I got a hold of Daniel Mudd, who happens to be their director, and I asked him, what is your affiliation with this? All of a sudden, you surface after four or five years. I've never heard of you. I didn't know Fannie Mae even had an office in Michigan. Uh, when did I ever do business with you? And they invoked this letter back to me, and it says, you inquired what Fannie Mae's role in relationship to, the, to your home loan. Fannie Mae acquired your loan in May of 99 and has owned your loan since that time. Our records show GMAC Mortgage Corporation serviced your loan for Fannie Mae. Well, that tells me that GMAC hasn't been the owner of it in a long time. It also says that somehow Fannie Mae acquired the loan. Well, if it's a Fannie Mae instrument down here at the bottom of it, it only makes sense, especially if you look at the actual date of the contract being the end of April. They got this all done, and then in May of that same year, I'd have to get the exact date because it just says May of 99, Fannie Mae acquired it. Well, what does acquired mean? Did they purchase it? Did, did GMAC sell it to them? Uh, what exactly is going on? Well, in order to do that, you have to find out, again, who, who is GMAC? Well, the first thing I did was I had to go back and look at some of their documents. People get these things called bills every month. Okay, On this bill, which is kind of an old one, you can see, I circled on here, it says, for questions on the servicing of your account, Call GM family first. Well, that might induce me into believing that they're a servicer. I looked at the original application, and down here at the bottom it said servicing disclosure and servicer transfer estimate. 
Well, that's really inducing me into believing that they're nothing more than a servicer. And then I get the letter back from Fannie Mae saying that GMAC was a servicer. Well, what is a servicer? I thought you were a bank that was just going to loan me your own capital and I was going to give you the money back. I mean, that's, that's the representation that I got from Tammy Lamb from GMAC in April of 99. <clears throat> what is a servicer? What are they servicing? It is Fannie Mae's, which means Fannie Mae took that interest and put it into a pool. You can all check into this. They put it into a pool loan. It's, it's part of their pooling and servicing agreements. You can find them at the SEC. Just ask the SEC for their servicing agreement, pooling agreement, and you'll find it. They put all these so-called interest and loans in a pool, and it's called a security. Now, <clears throat> inside of here, uh, this is right off the SEC's website for the 1933 Securities Act. Uh, when used in the subchapter, context otherwise requires, the term security means any note. Isn't that what that is? Right up there on the top of it, it even says it in bold letters. The only word is a note. That note is a security. Any note, stock, treasury stock, bond, debiture, evidence of indebtedness. Okay? Commonly known as security. Now, the term sale or sell. Um, Fannie, Mae, Fannie Mae used the word acquired. They didn't use sell or buy. They used the word acquire. But the term sale or sell according to the way that the securities industry works, shall include every contract of sale or disposition of a security or interest in a security for value. The term offer to sale, offer for sale, or offer shall include every attempt to offer, dispose, or solicitation of an offer to buy a security or interest in a security for value. Any security given or delivered uh, which <clears throat> with or as a bonus on account of the purchase of securities or any other thing shall be conclusively presumed to constitute, and there's that word presumed, uh, part of the subject of the purchase to have been offered or sold for value. The issue or transfer of a right or privilege when originally issued or transferred with a security giving the holder such security the right to convert such security into another security. And that's exactly what they did. They've converted this security into another security <clears throat> of the same of the issuer or person giving a right to subscribe to another security, the same issuer or another person, which right cannot be exercised until some future date shall not be deemed to be an offer or sale of such, but the issuer or transfer of such other security upon the exercise of such right of conversion or subscription shall be deemed a sale of other such security. A whole bunch of mumbo jumbo to say it might not be a sale, but in the end result it is a sale. A sale does include any kind of transfer. That transfer could be a uh, transfer of an interest in that piece of property, or it could be an interest in whoever signed it. You can get either one, because it's, it's what they call an entitlement right, which we'll get into. Uh, the term issuer, according to the same def, uh, statute, the 33 Act, means every person who issues or proposes to issue any security. Well, if you're not the issuer, then you don't have an obligation here. So again, it's just amplifying that you must be the issuer of this. Most people that I talk to, I'll ask them, who issued that, that mortgage? Well, the bank did. Well, the bank couldn't have, because if the bank did issue it, then it would be, one, a violation of law. Again, they cannot directly or indirectly pledge or hypothecate any of their notes in circulation. They can't do it. And number two, if they said it was theirs, then it would be their obligation. So it can't be that. Now here, the term underwriter, which a lot of banks are saying, we just underwrote it for someone else, or a mortgage company, they'll say, we, we just underwrote it for someone else. Well, according to the securities industry, the term underwriter means any person who has purchased from an issuer. Um, I, I'm, I'm really confused now. An underwriter is a person who purchased from an issuer. Well, if I issued this, and GMAC says that they were the underwriter, GMAC purchased this note from me. It, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Where's the bill of sale? Well, you got your house, didn't you? Did you use your own assets for this? We extended credit. Was that a yes or a no? If you purchased it, you had to have purchased it with your own money or 
You're admitting that you used Fannie Mae's money as a servicer for Fannie Mae, meaning that you never loaned me anything, meaning that when GMAC puts their lien on my property, it's actually a cloud on my title because GMAC never had a right to it to begin with. In order to do that, there has to be a clear and concise meeting of the minds and the assent and mutual assent of both parties on each and every element of this transaction. Signed in 99, and it wasn't until February of 05 that I found out Freddie, Fannie Mae had anything to do with this. Is that mutual assent and a complete meeting of the minds on each and every element? Not even close. Not even close. Now the term dealer means any person who engages either for all or part of his time, directly or indirectly, as an agent, broker, or principal in the business of offering, buying, selling, or otherwise dealing or trade, uh, trading in securities issued by another person. They're dealing in securities for someone else. This is the fun part that I was uh, um, real happy to find. Um, under 12, again, of the Code of Federal Regulations, which is the internal policies, internal regulations for Treasury, OCC, banks, the FDIC, the SEC, the Code of Federal Regulations, you're going to see this is at 1.2. <clears throat> Investment security means a marketable debt obligation that is not predominantly speculative in nature. A security is not predominantly speculative in nature if it is a rated investment grade. When a security is not rated, the security must, must, not may, must be the credit equivalent of a security rated grade investment. Marketable means that the security is registered under the Securities Act. Okay, and this is, again is the reason that I wanted to go back and, and explain to you why this is a security. It is a security uh, because common sense in the Uniform Commercial Code, Chapter 8, talks about it, but so does 12 CFR 1.2 and 1.3. It says down here, 3, under marketable, is offered and sold pursuant to the Securities and Exchange Commission rules and rated grade investment or is the credit equivalent of investment grade. Now, again, getting into is this a security or is it not? Um, again, we just read out of the book the four components, which are here. It's an obligation or other interest in the issuer or the issuer's property. Do they have an interest in this note? Do they have an interest in the mortgage? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Their interest is going to be one that's grossly misrepresented. Which one is it, though? Well, we have an interest in the note. Okay, where's the debt? Well, we got evidence of a, of a debt right here. I'm glad you have evidence of a debt. Where is the debt? Remember, the notes and the mortgages are nothing but hubcaps to a car. And you cannot bring a hubcap to a car into a courtroom and claim ownership over anything. It is totally presu presumed, and no judge can make any lawful judgment on a presumption. It has to be the positive law, legal facts, or the court only has the right to interpret Congress's full intent. Now, <clears throat> the reason I wanted to explain Article 8's definition of securities is very clear. Again, it must take the one of three forms. It must be bearer, registered, and uncer or uncertificated. It must be divisible into a class of uh, a series of shares. In other words, a jumbo certificate. A whole bunch of those put into one great big pool. It must function like a security, which again is dealt or traded in the, on the SEC and the securities market. And A down here, after you get done with it, says a financial asset is defined to include all securities. Again, this is going to match exactly with what we found inside public debt private assets within the Chicago Federal Reserve Board, uh, Bank's publication. It said in there that every asset is an obligation and vice versa. It's two different things. <clears throat> well, right here, it says a financial asset includes all securities. Well, security is defined as an obligation. So a financial asset is defined to include all obligations. So obligation and asset are actually interchangeable in terms. But most people don't think of it that way. They think of an asset as a, as a, as a coin or gold coin or their, their money or their house. You know, I, I don't think houses, houses or cars are assets at all. I think they're absolute liabilities, especially after learning this. 
Now down here it also goes through and says any property held in a securities account. Any property. Do they hold that in a securities account? Absolutely they do. They have to, otherwise they couldn't offer them on the open or second market. It's any property. So a financial asset is any property held in an account. Again, proving that that is actually an asset as well as a security. <clears throat> now getting back to the code here, um, the fiduciary powers of a bank, you can find it at 12 U.S.C. 92A under trust powers. 92A, the OCC is authorized to permit national banks when not in contravention of state or local law to exercise eight expressed identified fiduciary powers and to act in any other fiduciary capacity. Again, 92 is acting as an insurance agent or broker. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to find, if you go back a little bit in time, it is be before the 1999, you're going to find an act that's called the Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act made it mandatory that insurance companies and banks did not fall under one roof. They had to be separate. However, in 1999, uh, Bill Clinton, William Jefferson Clinton, signed into, into legislation um, repealing certain parts of the Glass-Steagall Act, yet bringing the rest of it forward under what's known as the Graham-Leach-Bliley Bill. In the Graham-Leach-Bliley Bill, what it did is it stopped the regulation required for an insurance company and a bank to be under the same roof. And the reason I'm bringing this up is it's actually quite important. Um, and also to bring it, to, to drive this home, I think everybody's heard of Bank One. Bank One was just bought by J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is, is an insurance company and Bank One is a bank. So now we have a bank and an insurance company under one building. And none of that happened until after the 1999 Graham-Leach-Bliley Bill, which allowed the insurance company and a bank to operate under one roof. But ever since 1999, I think it's only fair to question the fact, was I dealing with the insurance company who is investing some of my assets somewhere else? Or was I really dealing with the bank? Who am I dealing with now? That's why I don't like to leave the question of who. Who is the bank? Are you an insurance company? Are you a broker? Are you a dealer? Are you a bank? What kind of a bank? Do you have trust powers? <clears throat> Here's that section I was telling about earlier, 12 U.S.C. Chapter 2, Subchapter 4, Section 83. This is also going to be found in Section 35 of the original Title 62 of the Revised Statutes, which is at 13 Stat 99. Loans by bank on its own stock. General prohibition. No national bank shall make any loan or discount on the securities of the shares of its own capital stock. It can't use its own capital stock. Section 37 again says it cannot directly or indirectly pledge or hypothecate any of its own notes in circulation. And to drive that one home, it was codified in 12 U.S.C. 581. United States Code. They brought it forward and codified it. However, when you go there, they're going to say, well, 581 was repealed. Well, that's true. However, when you go to the notes, you're going to find out that it was repealed in Title 12 because it was transferred to Title 18. Title 18 is federal crimes. And that's the same one. Receipt of United States bank notes as collateral. They cannot use their own notes. It is a federal crime under 18 USC. They can't use their own capital, and we've proven that they cannot have money in two different spots, nor have they ever made an agreement to allow you to loan for the bank to loan your money out. So they can't do that either. So both these sections right here are clearly identified still inside of the revised statute as standing. Now, <clears throat> this part here was kind of interesting for me because it's dated June 16, 2003, yet I found it in August of 2002. I found it almost a year before online. Uh, and this is called the Debt Cancellation Agreement, which it's got its authority from this 12 U.S.C. 24 7th, which earlier in the conversation we was talking about pay close attention to 12 uh, U.S.C. 24 7th because that applied to those special purpose banks. What is a special purpose bank? The purpose of this debt cancellation is to ensure that the national banks offer and implement such contracts and agreements consistent with safe and sound banking practices and subject to appropriate consumer protections. The scope, uh, the National Bank's debt cancellation contracts uh, are governed by this part and applicable federal law and not by a different part or by state law. So it has to do with federal law. 
what is 12 U.S.C. 24-7? This right here is exercise the Board of Directors, duly authorized officers, subject to law, all such incidental powers as shall be necessary to carry on the business of banking by discounting and negotiating promissory notes, drafts, bills of exchange, and other evidences of debt, receiving deposits, buying and selling exchange coin bullion, loaning money on personal security. <clears throat> I want to stop there for a second. <clears throat> by loaning money on personal security. Why don't they just say by loaning the bank's capital? Why don't they say that? It's so easy to write that down, and it's so understandable. But here, it opens the door up by loaning money on personal security. Whose personal security? Whose money? <clears throat> by obtaining, issuing, and circulating notes according to the provisions of Title 62 of the Revised Statute. So in other words, every bit of this has to be consistent again with the Revised Statutes. It has to. It goes back to the Statutes again. But it goes on further, say the business of dealing in securities and stock by the association shall be limited, not may, shall, it shall, it must be limited to purchasing and selling such securities and stock without recourse solely upon the order and for the account of the customers and in no case for its own account. And the association shall not underwrite any issues of securities or stocks. They can't do what they're saying they're doing. They can't underwrite any issue of security or stock. They cannot issue it for its own account. It has to be for our benefit. How is it our benefit for them to take money out of our pocket, call it their own, and then get us to pay them back over 30 years with 8% interest while they create an interest certificate known as a pool certificate and go sell it to the secondary market and make triple, quadruple, if not five times the amount of the money that we gave them so that they can tell us that it was our money or their money to begin with. It just doesn't make any sense. Right here it says they cannot do that. And if they do, it needs to be according to the revised statutes, which again we covered earlier. It just doesn't make sense. However, I did want to point out in here, so I'm going to walk into this next, shall be limited to purchasing and selling. Well, <clears throat> here is the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1, Investment Securities. Earlier they talked about it needs to be a rated grade investment. Okay. And again, this right here is uh, Part 1, Investment Securities, which if you look inside of Article 8 of the Uniform Commercial Code, it also talks about investment securities. That's what the, it's entitled. It's entitled Investment Securities, Article 8 is. So we know that we got Article 8, 12 U.S.C., 24 7th, and 12 CFR, Part 1, Investment Securities, are all three parallel with each other. Okay, we've checked everything. Now here the purpose is again, uh, according to 12 U.S.C. 24 7th, which if we go back to that, brought us right back to Title 62 of the Revised Statute, and safe and sound banking practices. Now this scope right here uh, apply to national banks, District of Columbia banks, federal branches, foreign branches, further pursuant to uh, 335 of 12 U.S.C., state banks that are members of the Federal Reserve are subject to the same limitations and conditions that apply to national banks in connection with purchasing, selling, dealing, and underwriting securities and stock. In addition to the activities under this part, foreign branches of national banks are authorized to conduct international activities under 12 CFR 211. Now, again, 93A, Authority to Prescribe Rules and Regulations, is under the Glass-Steagall Act, which again was repealed by the Graham Leach Bliley Bill by allowing insurance companies and banks to be under one roof. But all of those still go back to and are created by the original intent of Congress, which is Title 62 of the Revised Statute. Now, again, um, this is just acquisitions of one corporation for another. Uh, it's basically our founding fathers designed the system of money so that there would not be a monopoly. The, the, at that point in time in history, is very, very clearly established anywhere you go, even on the Federal Reserve itself, that they wanted to get away from a central bank.